Hello, my name is Jonathan Lowell. I am the Engagements and Programs Coordinator for Planet Texas 2050, a research initiative at the University of Texas with the goal of being of service towards making the state of Texas more resilient and equitable. We do this by undertaking interdisciplinary research that aims to make societal impact. And as part of that project, we started this panel series, which we've called Resilience Roundtables, to bring together leaders across the academic, nonprofit, government, advocacy, and commercial sectors. And we organize these uh, with two to three speakers and a moderator from the Planet Texas 2050 network with topics that intersect with the issues of resilience, climate justice, disaster preparation and response, biodiversity, environmental humanities, and more. And before we begin, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement that was developed by the program in Native American and Indigenous Studies here at UT. We would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, we would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cusada, Caro, Cariso Comicrudo, Coyahuiltecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipin Apache, Tankawa, and Isleta del Ser Pueblo, and all the Amer American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. And in an recognition of the ongoing and cumulative challenges faced by indigenous peoples in Central Texas and globally, we call upon the University of Texas at Austin to repatriate the ancestral remains held by the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory to their indigenous descendant communities and native lands, to commit to the active recruitment and material support of Native American and indigenous students, to support the transition of the program in Native American and Indigenous Studies into a center, to establish a protocol of research and study on Native and tribal lands to foster an ethics and practice of engaged scholarship within four Indigenous communities and peoples locally and internationally. Um, so today leading us in our discussion is Dr. Heidi Schmalbach, who is the program director of Planet Texas 2050. So take it away, Heidi. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks everyone in Zoom land for joining us. Warmest welcome to our panelists, Trisha Bliss Wallace, Ashley Teamer, Dr. Sarah Woodward and Aaron Chang. I'm gonna start by asking you all to introduce yourselves and tell us just a little bit about your relationship to New Orleans, to Gentilly, to the Gentilly Resilience District project, and of course, to the Civic Arts Fellowship and anything else that you'd like to share. Um, we're also gonna post everyone's bios into the chat as we go in case y'all out there didn't get a chance to read that beforehand and know who is part of this conversation. Um, I'll, I'll kick us off um, and then I'll popcorn it around. Um, as Jonathan said, my name is Heidi Schmalbach. I am the director of Planet Texas 2050 here at UT Austin and a UT alum. I moved back to Austin in the summer of 2020 with my family. Um, before that, I was living in New Orleans for eight years. And from 2016 to 2020, I had the privilege of working at Arts New Orleans as the, the deputy and then executive director, where I worked with Aaron and Sarah to help design the first iteration of the Civic Arts Fellowship. I also lived in the St. Rock neighborhood, which for those unfamiliar is right below, closer to the river from Gentilly. Um, and I will kick it over to Bliss. Greetings, my name is Bliss. Um, so I was born and raised in New Orleans uh, and Gentilly, uh, Gentilly Woods to be precise. Um, I learned about this uh, fellowship through our government website actually. And um, when I saw Arts New Orleans was a part of it, I, I really wanted to, to get involved. Um, the reason I got involved is because I wanted to take part in the placement of art in our neighborhood. Um, and basically what I wanted to make sure was that um, it's not concrete and, and just big slabs of things that weren't there before. Our neighborhood is very beautiful. And um, I wanted to make sure that the trees and flowers were uh, incorporated into the design. 
So that's why I got involved. And um, it's been a very great experience for me. You can popcorn it to anybody else. Okay, uh, Aaron. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Aaron Chang. I am one of the co-founders of Water Leaders Institute and in that capacity have uh, had a chance to work with everyone on this call to design and implement the Civic Arts Fellowship over a couple of iterations. So I'm uh, really excited to be here and, uh, and and to contribute my perspective as an urban designer educator and somebody who's been working on water infrastructure and planning for uh, the last 12, 13 years in, here in New Orleans. Uh, let me popcorn it over to uh, Ashley. Hey everybody, um, my name is Ashley Teamer and I am from New Orleans and I am also from Gentilly. I grew up in Gentilly um, and uh, I'm an artist, I'm a visual artist. And so I um, answered the call of the Civic Arts Fellowship because um, it was an opportunity to uh, create a public artwork in my neighborhood where, I'm, where I grew up and also to respond to um, the changes in the neighborhood which like um, my house was flooded during Hurricane Katrina, for example. And so I was excited by the opportunity to kind of explore what, how that has affected me over time and also how the neighborhood and how the city is trying to um, alleviate some of those uh, situations. So that's me. Hi everyone. Yeah. So great to be here. My name is Sarah Woodward and I'm the Deputy Director of Arts New Orleans, where I primarily manage our youth and civic focused uh, public art programs. I, similar to Ashley, have a visual arts background with a particular passion for working with young people to create murals and, and other forms of public art. Um, I also come to this work as a researcher. I'm really interested in creative placemaking and, and the value of the arts and in educational and, and neighborhood settings. And then finally, um, as a, a native of New Orleans, I went to high school in Gentilly and you know, I'm someone who sort of sees my city facing these existential questions pretty much every hurricane season and, and heavy rainstorm. And so it's really been an honor to kind of integrate all those perspectives um, as we think about this work together. Thank you, panelists. I'm really, really thrilled to have you with us this, this afternoon. Um, one thing we didn't note is that um, if, as we go, uh, if anyone has questions, you can use the Q&A function to put those in, and then we'll save some time at the end to pose those to our panelists and have a chance to, to continue the discussion. Um, before we dive into the discussion, I wanted to share a brief background, both for, I know we have a lot of uh, folks in the audience coming from different, different places, both Austin, New Orleans, and elsewhere. Um, to give a little bit of context and familiarity, both for Planet Texas 2050 and for the Gentilly Resilience District. Um, as Jonathan noted in the introduction, PT 2050, which is the short version of Planet Texas 2050, is a 10-year interdisciplinary research program at UT Austin, which is focused on Texas's resilience in the face of climate change challenges and rapid population growth. Core to the mission of Planet Texas is the co-design of resilience research and solutions with non-academic partners, stakeholder groups, frontline communities um, all across the state. At this point, we have close to 100 active researchers who represent um, more than 30 academic departments across the university, so we're highly interdisciplinary. And we also work with many external partners and collaborators from climate justice and education, um, artists, cultural organizations, municipal governments, state agencies, um, and, and some industry groups, and as well as first responders um, and emergency managers. The Gentilly Resilience District is a combination of efforts in Gentilly, um, which is an area of New Orleans that you'll see on a map and learn more about from the folks who live and are from there. Um, the GRD, which is what we call it for short, is addressing a, a variety of 
or is, de is designed to address a variety of environmental um, as well as so social challenges um, through various approaches to water and land management. Um, the idea of the GRD was first proposed in the city submission to um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's NDRC, National Disaster Resilience Competition, I think in 2015, but Aaron, you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, and the city was subsequently awarded a $141 million grant to implement strategies and projects to help strengthen community resilience across um, multiple dimensions, which we'll hear about. Um, within the suite of programs that are part of the GRD, the Water Leaders Institute and Arts New Orleans came together to create the Civic Arts Fellowship. Um, and as I noted earlier, I had the absolute honor of working with Sarah, Aaron, and others, um, I, beginning around 2017 to, to put the pieces in place to um, make the Civic Arts Fellowship possible. So I can attest that there have been many, 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 many hours <laughs> that have gone of imagination and collaboration and care that have gone into creating this program and it's only expanded um, exponentially since then. Um, so I'm really excited and grateful um, for y'all being here. Um, thank you so much. And we'll launch into our first set of questions. Um, I am directing these questions to key panelists, but please answer anyone who, who has a response, uh, respond away and, and hope that this will turn into a conversation more than an interview. Um, I'd like to start by hearing from um, Bliss and Ashley as Gentilly residents and Aaron, who is one of the folks involved in the initial NDRC proposal that helped launch the Gentilly Resilience District. To, to talk to us a little bit more about the Gentilly neighborhood. Um, what, what are its characteristics? Um, what gives us it its sense of place? Um, what were the resilience challenges or that that the NDRC was designed to address or, or um, we're still working through? Um, and what are its intended outcomes? You can go in any order. Um, I'm happy to start just to kind of talk about the basic geography. So Gentilly, are we able to draw on this? I'm not saying if somebody could like find a way to drop a pin or circle. Um, so Gentilly uh, is a low-lying area um, that is uh, not quite kind of at the core of the city, which if you're familiar with um, New Orleans, the French Quarter is uh, where the, the historic uh, colonial city was founded. Um, in 1718. And over the course of the 19th and 20th century, the city expanded out, out, out into areas that used to be former swampland. So Gentilly occupies what used to be swampland. Um, and, uh, and with that comes a lot of challenges. You have low-lying areas that are really, it's a coastal condition. Lake Pontchartrain is connected to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so you used to have this space where the coastline was constantly shifting with the tides and with every storm. Um, you had the river and bayous depositing fresh sediments every spring. So that's how the land was built. Um, and then as soon as you start to put levees around it, as soon as you start to pump out that the water from the swamp in order to make it so that you can build houses and build roads, um, the, the, the ground starts to sink. And so that's the, the, the space, Gentilly, that's a, a, in large part, uh, probably on average four to five feet below sea level. Um, so much of Gentilly flooded um, after the levy, the flood wall failures and, and Hurricane Katrina. Let me go to the next slide. It shows so this is the kind of pre-colonial condition and how radically different. Again, the lakefront is at the bottom. Um, Lake Pontchartrain again connected to the Gulf of Mexico and all that area that is the thick white line and the kind of shaded white area. All that has been built up. That's artificial land that's been created in the 20th century. Um, and so when people talk about New Orleans being a bull, that very much is the case where there's this raised edge all along the lakefront. And so Gentilly, where you see GRD, St. Anthony Green Streets, Blue Green Corridors, that's where all of this work is, is taking place. Thanks, Aaron. And 
Bliss or Ashley, I'd love to, to hear y'all's thoughts on um, just giving us a, an idea, a feel for, for what the Gentilly community is like and the, the various neighborhoods within it. Anything that you would like to share to give us a sense of its sense of place. Um, I can I can contribute some things. Um, so I grew up in Gentilly and I pretty much lived in Gentilly consistently until Hurricane Katrina at the age of 13. Um, but recently my uh, sister and my brother and my aunts and uncles all live in Gentilly. So I pretty much whenever I'm in town, I um, stay in that area. Um, and I would I would describe it as like, um, at least for me growing up, it was pretty quiet um, and lots of trees um, and uh, just kind of a sense of community, I guess, a sense of connectedness, at least for me, my whole family lived in Gentilly. So um, it was really easy for me to kind of feel like Gentilly was my home because my everyone in my family just lived in a pretty close area. Um, and then I'll also say that I also grew up with the levee walls. So some of the canals you can kind of see in this image on the right, there's a, a canal that's kind of across. Uh, is that the canal? Is that by you, St. John? Um, that's but, a canal. Yeah, so there's a few different uh, canals that cross through Gentilly. So I definitely grew up um, not so there. Uh, the canals are have uh, these tall levee walls that um, are um, don't allow you to see the water on the other side. So um, while growing up in this like really nature filled kind of uh, tree lined bountiful area, um, I also grew up with these walls that kind of stop you from being able to see the water. So I kind of grew up not really knowing or fully understanding what was on the other side of the wall and what how that affected um, the water, my relationship to water um, as a young person. Thank you so much, Ashley. Bliss, I feel like you might be having a little bit of technical difficulty because you look frozen. Um, but we can, as soon as you're back, oh, is she back? If you wanted, to, if, if your, your bandwidth allows, would you share with us just, um, a little bit of your perspective on Gentilly as a community, as a neighborhood or a, a, a series of neighborhoods? And if that's not working, we'll move on and get your perspective in a moment. Um, I think, Ashley, what you were describing, um, I, I remember hearing this a lot when we were getting started uh, on working within the GRD is this idea of, of New Orleanians relationship to water, being surrounded by water, um, but but not always being able to interact with it, to see it or, or, or interact with it. And then, of course, um, you know, the relationship to, to water in general really of shifting um, post Hurricane Katrina. And Aaron, I wondered if you could um, talk a little bit more about that and, and really like, I know that you worked with Wagner and Ball in New Orleans for a long time and, and have spent a lot of time thinking about New Orleans and New Orleanians relationship to water. Um, if you could just talk more about that and then we'll um, maybe how that became part of the the um, idea behind the Civic Arts Fellowship and and how what what we were seeking to do together as Arts New Orleans and the Water Leaders Institute. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about the Water Leaders Institute um, to to address some of those um, relationships. Sure, and it looks like Bliss. It looks like you're back online. Do, um, do you want to share a bit about Gentilly before I dive into that? I'm back. Sorry, guys. Um, yes. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, growing up, okay, so when I came, I'll just start at coming to the cohort because um, I felt a lot of pride uh, in Gentilly and a lot was discussed um, when we came to the table, but um, mostly it's surrounded by water. Uh, the lake is basically in our backyard and um, it rains a lot. So um, I had a house that the backyard flooded every time it rained. So when the Gentilly Resilience District started, you know, coming up with solutions, 
um, my neighborhood was one of the first neighborhoods to actually um, be affected. They expanded the um, bankage so that the water could drain out and take less stress off the pumps. And um, it's just, it was a very beautiful place to grow up in. Um, it's still a beautiful place, not quite what it was before Katrina. Um, like I like to say that <laughs> I used to look up in the sky and barely see blue because there were so many trees, big, beautiful oak trees, um, pine trees, magnolia trees, um, you know, honeysuckle, lots of azalea bushes that um, that's one thing you don't see anymore. Um, and also people had uh, shrubs or, you know, bushes that line their walkways up to their doors. And you, that's another thing you don't see post Katrina. So, um, uh, you know, joining this cohort also found out about most of the artists actually were from Gentilly. So it was great to hear their experience and um, learn a little bit more. Um, got a couple colleges in, in, in Gentilly. So a lot, of, a lot of it for me growing up was about family, community, um, kind of pride in your work, pride in, in what you do. Um, if you uh, excel in something. I was in band and I'm a, I'm a musician, and by the way, I don't think I said that, but, um, you know, it, you wanted to excel in what you, in what you did. And the people in the neighborhood really celebrated you as well. You know, they see you, they congratulate you. Hey, whatever you're doing, even if it was something not so great, <laughs> they would check you and say, Hey, you know, that's the kind of neighborhood it was. And, um, it still is in some places. So that's good to know. I hope that gave up. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, would you all mind going back to the previous slide? Thank you. So the image on the left um, shows the the what happened in 2005. So the flood wall uh, failed and you essentially had the Gulf of Mexico pouring through that breach and knocking houses off of the foundations. Um, and that's one of the sites for some of the public art that Sarah is going to be sharing and talking about in a little bit. Um, and, and then on the right, that's an image from earlier this year. And so uh, both are images of floods, but uh, to show as Liz and Ashley had talked about, this is a space that was formed by water, the flow of water depositing soil um, and is constantly being reshaped by water. Despite our best efforts as a city, we spend over $50 million a year pumping out stormwater, trying to keep this bowl dry. And you can do that a lot of the time. There are times, whether it's a failure of infrastructure or the sub subtropical climate just drops so much rain on you. There's no, we already have the biggest pumps in the world. You can't uh, actually permanently keep a swamp um, dry. And so I think the some of the work that Heidi's reference is that really since Katrina, there's been, um, kind of an ongoing effort to reimagine um, across the city our relationship to water. If you live in the Delta, if you know that Gentilly used to be a swamp, if you know um, how the pumping system works and that the pumping system is actually also what's causing the ground to sink as you extract the water that causes the ground to collapse as you remove that water content um, and the organic materials start to decompose as they're exposed to air, um, what, what does that say, what, what does that require of us as we think about adaptation, as we think about climate change and sea level rise? Um, and so I think the, the city had this opportunity in 2015 to make an application to federal government. This was in the post Superstorm Stand, Sandy area, era uh, when New York City and uh, Connecticut and other parts of the East Coast had been badly hit. And so after that, HUD launched a billion dollar competition for communities along the Eastern seaboard to apply for uh, Sandy affected communities to apply for uh, funding to uh, enact resilience projects. And then they use that same model across the entire country. So then the National Disaster Resilience Competition was another billion dollar pot of funding. And they basically said to communities, you all, each community that's been affected by a disaster over the last two or three years, um, come to us with a plan for how you're going to protect your community and make it safer for, um, for the future. And so I was part of the team that was helping the city develop the proposal. And um, as Heidi said, the city was awarded $141 million. And you can see uh, in the diagram on the right, 
um, the projects. And so the idea was that throughout this area, uh, which is known as the Gentilly Resilience District, the city would implement um, some of the projects are uh, shown on the left. Um, so blue green corridors, um, how do we rebuild boulevards and neutral grounds to better handle uh, the storm waters that fall from the sky every single year, every summer? Um, how do we rebuild streets, that second row? How do we rebuild streets that are falling apart due to flooding and subsidence? How do we rebuild them to actually better manage, uh, again, stormwater? On the bottom, um, a 25-acre chunk of land known as the Mirabu Water Garden. How do we uh, develop campuses that serve both water management purposes, um, as well as uh, helping to reduce subsidence by allowing that water to infiltrate into the ground? and also serves as an environmental education center. Um, and so these three are just part of a larger set. You can see them outlined in the upper right. Um, projects at different scales, all working towards um, a new and uh, ideally healthier, more sustainable relationship to water where you're not constantly trying to pump every drop out or keep every drop out using bigger and bigger flood walls and levees, which becomes increasingly untenable as sea levels rise. Um, and so as part of the application, the, all of these engineering projects are good in the economic analysis of the benefits that it will bring. Um, but what we we're able to do as a team was make a case for art. Um, because we've been working at this for so long, we uh, really came at this with the belief that unless there's a cultural element, unless there's a social component where we are actually changing the language that we use, if our underlying like values and relationships and our ethics in relation to water and land haven't shifted, it doesn't matter how much new infrastructure you build, there won't be community buy-in, there won't be a shared sense of ownership of like the changes that are being brought. Um, and so we made a case and we're able to get into this $141 million grant, a line item that said there will be public art along the London Avenue Canal and throughout the Gentile Re Re Resilience District. And in that theory of change is that art has the capacity to shape civic dialogue to help us process both the histories and the traumas related to floodwaters, um, but also involve community members through this very different entry point. We're not talking about infrastructure, we're not talking about engineering, we're talking about stories, we're talking about valleys, we're talking about language, we're talking about beauty, aesthetics, and through that, um, through stories, um, we, we have a different entry point for community members of all ages to engage the themes that the engineers and planners and designers are also trying to engage. Here, here. Everything that you are, whenever I hear you talk about, and, and I want to, to hear much more and from all of you about um, the why of including artists and really, and, and in some ways centering um, artists as, as leaders um, in this work, I, I just want to like have a megaphone so that everyone can hear it. And like, sometimes um, I think the folks who are with us, who are, who work for city government, like that line item that you spoke about on the front end of, of a team writing a um, federal grant for funding is makes all the difference. Um, and it's it, it's easy to sometimes say, and then and we put in a line item for art and it was part of this huge project, but from the, the arts administrator side, um, having that champion or those champions, those advocates in, in the positions who are writing federal grants really helped open up um, this possibility of, of this program existing. And that's a, a segue into Sarah, maybe sharing a little bit about, um, coming working with the Water Leaders Institute on the on the um, design side of, of just like, okay, we have some funding that's part of this larger grant looking at um, resilience from, you know, heavily on the infrastructural side, but also considering all these other dimensions that Aaron spoke about, what are we gonna do? And if you could just give us a little overview of what the, what the Civic Arts Fellowship is and how it functions. And then from there, um, Bliss and Ashley, I would love to hear um, how you heard about it, how you got it. You've, Bliss, you, you noted this a little bit, but what was attractive to you about participating in something that isn't a small amount of time? It asks for a, a good amount of your, of your time and focus and you're both extremely busy people. So I'll start with Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. So when, when we started thinking about um, 
the role of public art. I think we were also, you know, really um, wanting to think about the roles of artists themselves and how does this work sort of ripple out beyond a one-time project because, you know, it's easy enough to create beautiful work, you know, that that beautifies the neighborhood, that adds some some dimension to it. But but we really wanted to have a very robust and and rich um, dialogue throughout the process of creating public art and to really um, involve artists and community members who wanted to become more involved in the really sort of long-term um, questions and challenges that that we face. And so um, the Civic Arts Fellowship is a, it's a cohort-based professional development program. So it operates really differently from um, a typical public art process where you would do a call for art you know, call for artists, you choose an artist and you, and the artist would, you know, dream something up on their own. We really felt that this sort of peer support, artist to artist, artist to Gentilly resident, resident to, to resident, that these really rich conversations and learning experiences would lead to something much more rich and engaging um, than, than what we're used to seeing in, in a public art call. And so, um, one thing that we talk about frequently with the Civic Arts Fellowship is really um, finding ways to honor um, to honor the technical experts, right? The folks, the engineers, the landscape architects, the planners who are really digging into some of these technical questions about infrastructure development and how does the water flow and, and all of these things, um, that that of course is incredibly important, but also the, you know, the Gentilly residents who have the lived experiences, who have, you know, the shared knowledge of, of what it means to grow up in Gentilly, to live and, and face these questions all the time, that that is equally important and, and then the artists as the creative practitioners the ones who are you know digging deep into imagination and storytelling and so how do you bring all of those perspectives together um and so the three um kind of facilitators of this um you know arts new orleans we're a nonprofit organization that's you know dedicated to um, to promoting arts and culture across the city. Um, and so that is, you know, the heart and soul of our work um, is supporting artists in transforming their communities. Um, Water Leaders Institute um, with Aaron Chang, and, you know, I can let Aaron get into Water Leaders. Um, uh, actually, Aaron, could you just quickly kind of share, share who Water Leaders is and, and then we can talk further. Sure, yeah, Water Leaders, we, uh started with Tanya James, uh, who works in, Houston, uh, in, in Texas, actually. Uh, but the basic premise is that every community member um, actually should have a seat at the table in thinking about the future of their neighborhoods and of their cities, that these big infrastructure questions about pump stations and levees, that uh, they're, not, they're not outside of the scope of what a, a neighborhood resident should be thinking about. And so we've, over the years, developed uh, various methodologies and processes, uh, cohort models to build leadership throughout a community um, and 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 so we were able to bring some of those strategies and approaches and methodologies in, into this program uh, working specifically with uh, the, the combination that Sarah's talking about of artists and community leaders right um, and then the third the third organization is prospect New Orleans um, who um, puts on a contemporary art exhibition um, every three years in New Orleans. And so all of these kind of perspectives uh, were brought together to think through how do we how do we work with a cohort of of professional artists and Gentilly residents and bring in the technical expertise. Um, and so we'll get into a little bit more about sort of the what sort of, you know, the journey that our civic arts fellows um, have gone on together. Um, but as an overview, we, you know, really wanted to focus, of course, on the city's relationship with water, the ongoing, you know, challenges around water management, around creative interventions, um, sort of zooming in at the neighborhood level and zooming out to sort of this, the city and coastal level. Um, really creating um, opportunities for 
um, you know, residents to share about their neighborhood, about the culture and the values and the history, um, all of that really rich um, uh, discussion that Bliss already brought up. Um, and then to think about, you know, public art best practices, how do we create work um, that, you know, will will remain for a long time that will really sort of speak to, um, to these questions in a really, in a really rich way. Um, and so, all of that, bringing all of that together, creating a process by which um, it's not just the artists creating work on their own, but really co-creating these public art proposals in a in a community engaged setting. Um, and so um, it's it's been a really beautiful process to witness. Um, and the the result of it, at the conclusion of the Civic Arts Fellowship, we have $130,000 that's dedicated to the creation of public art. And so that looks like multiple projects ranging from smaller budgets to larger budgets of 5,000 to 75,000. And really importantly, um, paying all of the artists and Gentilly residents um, for their time. Um, you know, it's not enough to compensate <laughs> them, uh, but, but it's something and that I think we found really important um, to making sure that people could really fully participate in this work. So I think we should go into our fellows sharing what, what drew them into the work. That looks like me. It does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, besides being a singer, I um, am the president of Thinking Beach and Community Advisory Committee. Um, I started this work um, in May of 2020. It was kind of our, um, we, used to, we were calling it a peaceful protest, but really um, it was a historic space. Um, historically black beach that um, has been closed since 1964. And, um, but has been used as a, uh, really a, it's people fish and swim and, and, you know, relax and use it as a beach. So we cleaned it up. And um, so some of the pictures here are showing, um, it took two years, but we got the cities to remove, um, over 2,000 uh, pounds of trash from the beach uh, that we had collected and bagged up. Um, this is me uh, getting a proclamation. This is um, a picture. This is a, the old swimming pool and people dive in. And this is today, um, what the beach looks like now at the bottom. Um, oh, and I graduated from the Civic Leadership Academy uh, just recently. Um, this picture in the corner is work that uh, we've done with the Water Leaders Institute. Um, so whew, so as I got involved in this because I was very interested in water and um, how it affects our area. And I also, um, I like how the Water Leaders Institute talks about living with water and not um, trying to keep it out. So. Um, I'd already done a couple, gone to a couple um, activities that they had done and met with Aaron and talked. So um, when I saw him there, I was like, oh, all right, cool, yes. But um, my very first meeting um, <laughs> blew me away because um, we, we talked about climate justice in, in, in different ways, not just about how it affects us directly. And then we expanded out and um, Alana, the, the residents to speak about Gentilly was just um, that in itself, that conversation in itself was very moving. And um, I walked away feeling very proud to be a Gentilly resident. Um, but having the space to, to discuss um, and talk about what's great about this space you know, what, what needs to change? What doesn't need to change? How does it make you feel? How do you want to feel in the spaces where we're going to, um, that are going to change? And um, some of the things that came up was like, fear of water comes up a lot with people in New Orleans. Um, so we discussed that. And I feel like um, the, the first 
art installations that that the group did. Um, when we got to visit those sites, it um, it made me feel safe. It made me feel like you know really respected the neighborhood and went along. You know, it it fit perfectly, but also brought it together, brought a space for people to gather, which um, we don't have very many spaces to just gather in gentility and enjoy the nature, enjoy what's already there, what's in there. And um, to, right, when, when we went here, and this is actually where we had um, the, the art parade that we came up with, but I know we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, for me, the why of it, um, was fulfilled. It was fulfilled in this cohort. I felt like um, I really did have a voice and I really did affect change and that being able to talk with the artists um, and the architects gave everyone kind of an, a different perspective on how it affects each other. And um, what do we all want? Even if we're not from Gentilly or don't frequent this space, what would make us come to this space and enjoy it? So. Um, we had a lot a chance to explore a lot of the questions. And I, I think that um, as it progressed, um, we watched the art change. You know, and, and become more it's it's like we, we're a part of we're a part of a, a growing, expanding, you know, work in progress. So it's beautiful. Awesome. Thank you for that. That that I was like remembering all the good times when you were talking um, bliss. Um so I'm Ashley Teamer. I'm a visual artist. I'm also a Gentilly resident and New Orleans person. Um and I think I'll just try to start with the cohort. I think that is something I want to emphasize is um, as, a, as an artist um, on this page, you can see in the top left corner, I made a series of billboards um, last, I think that was last year. This is one of, this is like an initial billboard and then I made an additional series of seven billboards, but I have never made a public sculpture before. And actually this was probably my first public art project, the billboards. Um, and so the, the fact that this was a cohort that was, also simultaneously teaching you about the relationship to water in Gentilly, the history of water management in the city, and also how to even do a public art proposal. I think that is like, was those two elements, like that it was a cohort of artists and residents that um, we were learning how to go about proposing and learning about the, the issue that we were gonna be working with. I think that really made me wanna do it. If it had just been an open call, whoever can come through and put an application, I wouldn't have applied because I, though I have a lot of material experience, I hadn't just done that one thing, which was do a public art application. And they always say, once you do one, you kind of get it. So this was really an amazing experience to learn that process and then also have real-time feedback from people who are the audience, um, who are in the room, who are like brainstorming and learning alongside you. So as an artist, um, it's a it was a really amazing experience to have both of those things um, because then you know your work is gonna have an impact and you don't have to wonder, oh, is this gonna work? Like, you know, you really know it's gonna live and breathe and um, um, be helpful. Um, and then the other, the other uh, part of this, the content is also something that brought me to the project. I, um, like I said, I'm from New Orleans and I kind of, in my artistic journey, you know, I've gone on different residencies and experienced different landscapes. And um, in 2015, I had the opportunity to live on a sailboat off the coast of Maine. And when I was doing that, I realized that I was from a place surrounded by water, but I had never interacted with the water in the way that I had in that sailboat all the way in Maine. So it made me really like reflect on, um, it just, it started this wheel of water and the significance of water in my life turning and the symbolism of it, that it is the way that my ancestors came to this country. It's also a life-giving resource. It also is a, a thing that is I, that I fear also because of uh, living in New Orleans. Um, so, you know, in 2015, my, my brain kind of got working on that. And then 
um, that was kind of meshed in with the environment and the, our environment today, like live, um, um, because of the past two years I've been in graduate school. And it, during that process, I was able to really reflect on my home. And when I, my home literally, the place, the foundations where my house was sitting in Gentilly before it was uh, flooded. And so because I was really focused on that spot and I went and photographed where my house used to be and I really was meditating on just the, the porous barrier between our bodies, our homes and the environment. And that, you know, the way that water has been managed up until this point has been with like, kind of like Aaron was saying with these kind of like concrete barriers. And something I learned on our journeys um, around the city, um, was that actually all these barriers are porous and it hurts us more to try and create um, hard stops. And so in my artistic practice, I do a lot of collage. And so um, I have been in my artwork kind of thinking about the porous barriers between images, between materials, um, and between different styles. Um, so for example, like on the bottom left, I put a speaker in a chair that I made. Um, again, like I on this billboard, it's a printed image, but I painted, hand painted on top of it. Um, and then in these pieces, you can kind of see that I kind of use painting, phot photography and thread to kind of merge different realities together. Um, and so, this project was just spoke to me because of how all those things that I'm really passionate about um, kind of coalesced on this opportunity. That was gorgeous. And Ashley, I've been a big fan of your work for a long time and it's very, I'm more, more of it in big and in public <laughs> is, is wonderful. Just following the how your practice has evolved. It's just, um, it's really special. Um, Sarah, maybe we could, we're of course running out of time so fast. Talk about what you did together. <laughs> I think giving people and I, and then everybody can sort of jump in and, and, and add into that. And I think it'll naturally, um, you know, speak to some of the questions we have about why it is so crucial to create these opportunities where artists and residents and who experts, and I think we can maybe talk about expertise instead of experts, because we're saying that everyone has, everyone who is part of this process has expertise that they are bringing to the process. And it's the, the sharing and the co-creation um, that really makes this something, something um, different than, than a standard public art process or a standard um, planning process. Tell us what you did, all of you. Yeah, I can I can just start us off and say the kickoff event was just this magical dinner where we all got into a room. It was buzzing with the most passionate conversation about Gentilly and pride in the neighborhood and just sharing family stories about, you know, growing up on it. Several of our artists, you know, had family members who had grown up, you know, along London Avenue Canal and had these stories about fishing in the in the canal. So you can see um here, um, this is the canal that we're referring to, and there is, it, it, it's, Ashley spoke a little bit about how um, this canal out to the lake is hidden behind these large concrete walls. And so if you're in the neighborhood, you have very little interaction with the water itself. Um, and so after this sort of beautiful kickoff dinner um, of just sharing and grounding ourselves in the neighborhood, we um, went on a, a neighborhood walking tour together. Um, and this walking tour was created by the Water Leaders Institute um, to really take the fellows um, around the neighborhood with an attention to these different themes around, you know, climate and adaptation, around, you know, resilience. Um, and so we visited um, water infrastructure. So here is the, the pump station, right, something that we hear about in the news during every rainstorm event, but that hardly anyone in New Orleans is actually visited in person. So here's the pump station, right? Um, just sharing of maps, sort of looking at, at the micro level. Um, here you can see the impact of, of land subsidence, um, where, you know, this was once 
at the top right image level with the ground, right? So seeing these moments of, of just sinking earth and, you know, these are things that people are experiencing um, day to day and, and relating that back to um, Gentili as a former Cypress swamp. So the, the top left image here is what Gentili once was. Um, and so I'll, I'll kick it off. The, the next piece that we did was a regional water tour. Um, and I'll let maybe um, Ashley or Bliss or Aaron kind of talk about um, ex what expanding out from the neighborhood level looked like um, in terms of our, our process. Aaron, do you want to take this? Oh, Ashley, I'll be sure about that. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I learned so much from this. <laughs> I think the, the, the beauty of it was being in a space, it's like saying, hey, the, the world is visible in that manhole cover. The, the mundane has the keys to everything that we're trying to, how do we connect the experience of a giant pothole to, um, to, I, I remember, I forget who it was, one of the artists maybe talking about what it felt like to walk upstairs to get to the drainage canal and like that registering as, wow, this is actually really strange um, that we're climbing up to the drainage canal that's supposed to, where so you usually drain to the low ground. And in New Orleans, we create these conditions where the drainage canal is actually high um, and it's also hidden behind walls. And so I think that the, the, we're always really keen on making sure um, nobody ever gets locked in on just one phenomenon. And, and so we uh, created these experiences, the neighborhood, the history, the, the, the tactile, and then we expand that out to, if you go to the next slide, um, looking at the Mississippi River, looking at where does our drinking water come from, where does, um, and then even, even farther out, all the way to Bonnie Carey Spillway. Um, and at every stop, each person has an experience. Um, if you show the Bonnie Carey spillway slide, uh, I think we had plant enthusiasts who are pulling specimens and, and teaching. So everyone there has knowledge. Everyone is constantly teaching each other. And the, the kind of final experience that day was to make a drawing together, to start to imagine what a just, uh, like a, in terms of justice, a just Mississippi River might look like. And, the, and so we were, in that space of how do we create this seems it's both an insanely complex activity how do you draw a river together um, but somebody suggested why don't we all trace our hand and quite literally have our hand and it's working through visual ideas working through what are some shared values of justice that we all believe in how do you start to create common ground that then an artist might take forward um, but like bliss said a lot of the gentility residents are artists and musicians and a lot of the artists are just resident so uh, creating a, a shared space of of, uh, of uh, uh, exploration um, learning language and, uh, and then and then actively making uh, new things um, through a series of these tours uh, story circles and then a kind of uh, uh, reflection activity using these index cards we're able to work towards groupings of ideas and themes and values and priorities. And so what Sarah's pulled up here are um, what the artists, all the fellows together uh, develop these in bold, uh, these main values. And that then guides all the artists work. I feel like, Bliss, you mentioned the art parade maybe, yeah. and you were, you're such a leader in imagining that. Okay, uh, well, I was about to say, I'm glad you called on me, <laughs> that um, the storytelling, the story circles for me was, um, was huge because um, it allowed us to, first of all, I wanna say everything was so chill and relaxing. Nothing was like, oh, you have to have all this pressure to come up with this idea. You know, everything was just very, very gentilly, <laughs> but uh, they called it chilly gentilly. But um, this, the story circle allowed uh, the way that you guys partnered us up to, it's like it, you had a fellow, an, uh, an artist and um, someone from the design team and, and um, we built off each other's stories and um, 
it brought it it brought a unity amongst our differences which was which really allowed us to think outside of the box so the idea that we came up with was um we thought about how do we make people aware of what we're trying to do how can they feel the art you know in the space you know what will this art feel like in this space so from that idea we were like okay the easiest thing the easiest way to accomplish all this is a festival but we were also like you know festivals such as so cliche here in New Orleans there's a festival or a few festivals every weekend so we said okay um people like parades so um one of the residents said parade the parade of houses how they do the Mardi Gras floats in place. Um, and when we couldn't parade, uh, people just decorated their houses and called it a parade of floats. So we decided to do the art parade. And um, <laughs> the planning process for me was so impressive that I, I want to work with Water, Water Leaders Institute on everything I do. <laughs> but um, we executed to the T what we set out to do. And that was the thing that was most impressive to me because everybody was a part of it. And when there were things that hadn't got done or maybe we hadn't thought of, someone said, oh, wait, that's still not done. Okay, I can do that. And the entire festival was powered, was solar powered. The DJ was solar powered. And um, I'm not sure that we've had a solar powered festival in New Orleans until this. So, um, it's great to be a part of a team that was innovative and, and um, ready to expand and do things that we hadn't done to accomplish a goal. Um, and, and as you can see, the community really showed up. They came out, enjoyed themselves. And by them enjoying themselves, that's what made them want to participate. You know, let, let's go see. And, and all the um, artists really had interactive um, activities and I think that everyone walked away with a sense of understanding you know what was happening because um, really I, I only know what's happening because I pay attention now because of the work that I've been doing I pay attention so I get notifications and I know that the people in my neighborhood aren't aren't talking about you know I haven't heard anything about um the Gentilly Resilience District work that they're doing amongst my neighborhood, you know, amongst the people, unless it was in their neighborhood and it happened there, people aren't really knowing what's going on. So I felt great about getting people out and giving them a chance to understand what's happening in their neighborhood. And maybe, you know, you start to pay attention now. Yeah, I think something that I was thinking while we were talking was that art also educates people and then the artists and the participants, like the the this neighborhood participants, we all become conduits for information. And so as like we try to come up with ways that we need to change our environment or live differently, art artists and residents kind of become people who can spread the word and deliver the message in a way that people can understand. And so I think that's another thing, why, reason why this the parade was really successful too, is because the information was able to be um, just digested in a way that was active and kind of joyful versus like the fear of what the change, with what, what would happen without the change. We're so woefully running out of time, but I cannot let you all go. I thought that a deep dive would give us more time, but it doesn't. There's just never enough time to hear to hear it all. Um, if you can stay for a couple more minutes, I would love. You can't leave without showing us some of the work that has come out of this amazing, thoughtful process. And Bliss, I just wanted to say something you said earlier about entering the question of how do you want to feel is such a good way to start out any co-creation process, like in any thing that we're not just in, in planning for a space, but um, that'll stick with me. Take it away, everybody. Sure. 
Yeah, I just want to share the, the couple of images of the sculptures. Um, and you can see uh, one of these is my Zoom background as well. Um, so these were sculptures created by our youth artists and our young artist movement program. Um, who chose, who really identified, they took the same neighborhood walking tour that our civic arts fellows took, and they were really um, drawn to the site of the London Avenue Canal levee breach. Um, so that's, you know, if, if I can just quickly share that image again that Erin spoke to, this is what, it, what this site was during Hurricane Katrina, right? So just this incredibly um, traumatic um, life-shifting event. Um, and the students in their research process um, and working with our civic arts fellow, Carl Joe Williams, spoke to residents who said, listen, you know, we have enough of the public art that speaks about the trauma and that shows us the images of our flooded homes and, you know, all of these really tr triggering images. Um, what we want is a public art piece that gives us peace, um, peace of mind and a place where we can just come and, and sit. And, you know, we have those images imprinted on our minds already. And so um, I don't have the close up images, but if you look closely, there are all these sort of hopeful and inspirational words that are embedded um, into this um, into this piece. Um, this is a series of sculptures that were placed in a rain garden. Um, that kind of speak to uh, the, the theme of harmony. How do we live harmoniously with nature? Um, and the students made castings of, of plastic bottles that they um, cast in aluminum. Um, they had images of native plants and, and all these other images that sort of spoke to them around, around water management. Um, this is a piece that I think um, is it's currently in the works. It hasn't been installed yet, but it's at the same site of, of the London Avenue Canal levee breach. And this piece is called Periscope to the Future by Hannah Shalou and John Kleinschmidt. Um, this is an artist and architect team who really wanted to address that issue of not being able to see into the canal. And this is, I think, a really helpful view. We've been talking about how you can live in the neighborhood and, and have no idea where the water is and that the water is actually above you. So you can see the height here. And so the artists, what they've proposed is creating this deconstructed periscope that has a mirror on it, where when you stand below it, you can look up at the mirror and actually see into the canal. And so there will be a mural placed on the outside edge of the, of the canal wall and the indoor and the inside edge. And so by looking up, it completes this, this vision that you don't have access to as a neighborhood resident. And so you can see, we actually brought a crane out during our Gentilly art parade on the left-hand side for the artists to experiment with the exact size and placement of that mirror. Um, so it was a really bizarre sight to see as part of a quote unquote Gentilly art parade, <laughs> but I think it brought a lot of people into it. Um, I'd love, since we don't have a lot of time, for Ashley to speak about her proposal. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll say something really quickly. Um, I came into the, this project wanting to make something that was interactive in some way. I felt like if we were, I wanted to really embody that changing the relationship to nature component. Um, and so that's kind of what was in my mind as I started. Um, and at the Gentilly Art Parade on the left side, you can see my friend and colleague, Amanda, who um, man, like uh, did my activity for me because I wasn't in town on that day. But um, I created this kind of tube where you could ideally imagine talking to water. And what would you say to the water if you could, if it could hear you and if it could listen to what you had to say. Um, and that link at the top, um, I can try to drop it in the chat. You can hear what recordings we made at the Gentilly Art Parade. So you can hear the different things that people said to the water. And, messages that they had. And so my concept was to kind of like take a, de a deconstruct a sousaphone, which is like a staple second line band instrument in New Orleans and make it so it's kind of opposite where you speak into it and you kind of symbolically speak to the water that is below. So um, 
the pr printed text on the inside is in the style of like a second line band. They will like write the name of the band. For example, Rebirth Brass Band, if you look them up, you'll see how they write their name on the inside of the sousaphone. So um, inside of that, it would say, talk to the water, tell the water your secrets. Um, and just, I just wanted something that would encourage us to uh, break down the barrier between us and the water because we are porous to our environment. And we see that through like, Cancer Alley in Louisiana and the relocation of Gordon Plaza residents. So um, this was just a gesture towards communing with the water in a way that is real um, and, you know, listening to hear if the water has anything to say back. Um, I think that's, that's a quick, uh, yeah, quick summary. Let me see if I can grab that link. Yes, please. And when we put the, um, when we put the recording up too, which we do, we'll put it on YouTube and also on our website. We can also link um, beneath it to for folks who want to learn more. I am heartbroken that we are out of time and I've already kept you six minutes over time. So thank you for the audience who is still with us. And we did not ignore any questions. Um, I think you're just answering everything so thoroughly that nobody has any questions. Um, I have plenty, but I don't have time to ask them. Um, maybe we can do a part two in, in sometime in the near future and, and hear how, um, what was selected and how, how the next iteration runs out. Um, thank you so, so much for sharing this incredible process that you all have poured um, yourselves into. It really shows, um, I'm so proud to have played like a teeny tiny role in this project because the, the work that you all are doing is um, really inspiring. I'm gonna send this to, um, colleagues in the city of Austin <laughs> to try to say like, see, here's why, here's why we're pushing for this. Um, I really appreciate all of you and I love you. Thank you. Until next time.